What's up, Madison? Look somebody deep in the eye, give them a high five, and tell them, I love you so much. All right, hey, I'm glad you're here today. We're going to have a lot of fun. Um, I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to count to three, and then I'd love for you to yell out your answer, okay? Here's the question. What do you already know about spiritual warfare? One, two, three. Yell it out. All right, I don't know what you said, but uh, if you don't know anything about spiritual warfare or if you think you're an expert on spiritual warfare, I'm glad you're here today because this stuff is important. And, and here's why this is important. Because wherever God's kingdom is growing, there will always be spiritual resistance. Let me say that one more time. Whenever God's kingdom is growing, there will always be spiritual resistance. If you're asking a God to help you grow in your faith, you can also believe that there will also be resistance. If you want God to grow in, in, in his influence in your family, there will be spiritual resistance. If we want to see God grow in our churches, there will be spiritual resistance, and we need to be prepared for it. Uh, uh, in fact, last week we talked about what is spiritual warfare, and we gave kind of an overview of that. I want to encourage you to go back and watch the YouTube video if you missed it. Uh, but today, we're going to talk about how to counterattack. Uh, go ahead, show Napoleon Dynamite counterattack. Um, what happens when, when we get a, you know, a spiritual punch to the face? How do we counterattack that? That is what we'll be discussing today in the next few weeks. So with no further ado, let's talk about the most important thing we're gonna talk about today, the scripture. If you don't hear anything else, here's what I'm asking you to hear. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses three, four, and five. Here we go. We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. Let me say that one more time. We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. All right, I love it. This is God's word. Let's explore it. Let's start off with number one. The first thing is this. What should we expect when it comes to a spiritual attack? Well, each week we're going to be looking at a common spiritual attack, and today I think is one of the most common spiritual attacks we see, and it's falsehood. It's lies. In fact, the scripture here says, uh, Paul says, um, uh, we knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. Now, we talked about uh, uh, what the devil means, the word literally the devil means last week. Um, everyone in Madison, what, what does that mean if you were here last week? the accuser, the slanderer. And one of the number one tactics we see coming from our enemy is, is falsehood, lies, accusations. Now, if we're going to be ready for spiritual resistance, we have to know his tactics. Uh, the scripture teaches us, do not be unaware of the devil's schemes. And the number one scheme that we see is falsehood. It's falsehood. Uh, there's a, a beautiful line about this in Pilgrim's Progress. A Christian who's the main character, he's going on this journey, and he comes upon this thing, and it says it's like a, a pit full of demons. And as he walks up on it, it says that a demon came up behind Christian and spoke so closely and so quietly, the, Christ, the Christian thought that those blasphemies were coming from within. And I think that's a beautiful way, or maybe I should say a horrible way, of thinking about it, the spiritual warfare of falsehood. Uh, but uh, that's not a horrible way of thinking about it. Uh, we hear lies that come from out without. We, come, we hear lies that come from within. And, and, and I love that imagery that John Bunyan gave in Pilgrim's Progress. So this idea of like, just like a, a demon, the, the devil whispering in so closely that we thought that, that it was our own thoughts. And so I want to ask you the question of what falsehoods are you giving into today? What lies about yourself are you listening to? Are you here and you think you'll never be good enough? Do you think you'll never be at a place where you can serve God or be used by God? Or are you at a place where you think your marriage can never get better? 
Or are you at a place where you, you've just written yourself off and you said, hey, like, I'm, I'm just never going to be a people person. I'm just never going to have that relationship. I'm never going to find that special person. I'm never going to get healthy in my finances. I'm just saying that remember, our enemy is known as the accuser, the false slanderer. What lies are you listening to? Now, unfortunately, the lies are not only about ourselves. <laughs> not only does our enemy uh, accuse us, he also accuses others to us. In fact, why don't you look at somebody right now? Look at somebody, look them deep in the eye. Not only do you hear lies about yourself, but our enemy tells you lies about them as well. And in fact, I mean, just think about it. Who's frustrating you right now? Who are you upset with? Who are you angry with? Is it possible that you're actually believing a lie about them? Is it possible that maybe there's some half-truth, but in your mind, the story just keeps growing and growing and growing? It's kind of like one of those fish tales where you ask somebody, hey, how big was the fish? And the truth is, it was like that big, but they keep, you know, every time they tell the story, the fish gets a little bit bigger. Is it possible you're telling yourself a story about the person sitting next to you or the person at work or the person at school, and every time you think about it, that lie just gets a little bit bigger? That's spiritual warfare. Now, if, if, the main, if the enemy's main tactic against us is falsehood, how do you think we counterattack? How do you counterattack falsehood? You counterattack falsehood with truth. Let's look at the second point. The way we counterattack is with truth. It's with truth. I love what the scripture teaches. It, it talks about how we, we knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and we destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people, including us, from knowing God. Now, now, how do we do this? Well, last week we talked about uh, Ephesians chapter 6 and how we have been provided spiritual warfare tools. Uh, our armor of God is how we refer to it. In fact, we can go ahead and look at a list of those, uh, those uh, tools that God has provided us and the Apostle Paul is really clear in Ephesians chapter 6 that you while know, yes, God has provided these tools for our use, it is on us to put those tools on. God has provided you a shield, a, 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 a helmet, a sword, but it is on us to take those things and to use them. Uh, some of these weapons that we have been provided with are a shield of, of, of salvation, truth, the word of God, faith, righteousness. And the one that I really want to focus in on today is the sword, or the word of God, the Bible, if you will. What the scripture teaches us is that the way that we counterattack falsehood is with God's word, our sword, with truth. Um, when we hear a lie about ourselves or when we hear a lie about somebody else, we should learn to go to the scripture to know how to counterattack that falsehood. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is God-breathed, it's useful for teaching, correcting, and training in every act of righteousness. Romans chapter 12, go ahead and show that. Romans chapter 12 says that we are to have the renewal of our minds. How do we have that renewal of our minds? So that we can discern God's will? The word of God. This is how we do it. Uh, let me illustrate it like this. Uh, there is um, there's a, a fancy word. Go ahead and show, go ahead and show the word here. Um, see if anybody in Madison can pronounce this word. Palimpsest, palimpsest. Now, every time I told Pastor TJ this word, he thought I was saying the word incest. That is my Alabama, uh, you know, twang. No, it's not incest, it's palimpsest. Now, here's what palimpsest means. That's, that's not a Greek word, it's, it's one of our English words. And what it means, it's, it's an artistic word. It's when an artist takes um, some sort of uh, uh, medium, like, like paper, and let's say they had some sort of drawing on the paper, and they, they, they actually scrape it off so that they can do a new painting on top of the old. That is a palimpsest. Uh, you may be familiar with some, you know, some famous stories of this where you know, they discover a Leonardo da Vinci painting and they, they look at it with infrared technology and they can actually see that da Vinci had an older drawing that he erased to paint on top of it a masterpiece. Theologically, we can think of this as the palimpsest of Christ. That when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, all the old was, 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 was erased off. All the old is taken off, and instead Christ is painting a masterpiece on you. I can illustrate it like this. Uh, everybody's favorite workplace tool, at least it's Pastor TJ's favorite workplace tool, 
This is what he takes all of his notes on in our meetings. Uh, it's an etchy sketch. Is that how you call it? An etchy sketch. And, and you can think of it like this, an etch, an etch, an etch sketch, an etchy sketch, a sketchy etchy. Okay, and you can think of it like this, right? There's just a trash. You ever known somebody who just made a mess of their life? Anybody sitting next to them? Don't, don't answer that. And, and, and what we see in Christ is that you've, you've got this, this mess, and then, and then you, you find Christ, and you start reading the scripture, and then all of a sudden, it's like, it's like hang on, it's, like, it's erased. Christ erases it, and he begins to draw a masterpiece. A masterpiece. Now, now, now what happened here? There was, there was mess. And Christ, he came and he, he erased it. There was a palimpsest. And he put a masterpiece on top of it. But you want to know what spiritual warfare looks like? It looks like our enemy, the accuser, coming up to you and whispering in your ear, oh, that masterpiece? No, 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 no. Look at all the blemishes. Or, or we hear about who he used to be before Christ began making a masterpiece in us. You'll hear little stories about, oh, you're just a mess up. You'll, you'll never get past that. You'll, you'll never improve that. And nobody's ever going to love you. Nobody's ever going to want a relationship with you. There's no way God can use you. That's what spiritual warfare looks like. But let's not forget that that spiritual warfare is not just about you. You're also hearing that spiritual warfare about the person sitting next to you. Oh, they'll never be good enough. Here, Christ is doing something beautiful in their life. There's the palimpsest of Christ. And yet, when you think about them, when you look at them, all you can see are the little smudges on the side or those old memories of who they used to be. Friends, we cannot allow the devil to get a foothold in our lives. Whenever we see those little weeds of falsehood creeping up, we've got to counter it with truth. We've got to get to the place where we're fact-checking those lies. You hear something about someone, fact-check it. And fact-check it with the scripture. What does the Bible say? Let me give a couple for instances. If I can be real with you, there are times when my beautiful, incredible, awesome wife, Kristen, sometimes loads the dishwasher incorrectly. And I'll get up early one morning to have time with God. And I'll go to the dishwasher, I'll open it up, get the clean dishes, and I will see my favorite coffee mug on the top rack, and it's fallen over sideways during the clean. And this is why that happens. Kristen likes to straddle the nubs in the dishwasher instead of putting them in between the nubs. And when you straddle the nubs, the cup falls over. And when the cup falls over, little back, like little water gets stuck in that cup with who knows what in it. And so when I wake up early in the morning to spend time with God, I get my mug and it's got this nasty water in it. And so I go and I wash it off because I don't know where that water's been. And I pour my coffee and I go sit down. And I begin reading scripture. And the scripture begins reading me. <laughs> and palimpsest. Palimpsest. I read where the old me would have been mad. The old me would have given my wealth, my, my wealth, my wife an earload about how she didn't load the dishwasher right. But instead, I see where scripture teaches us that I'm to love my wife the way that Jesus loves the church. What happens? I'm obsessed. The old, <laughs> the old, man, I wanted to give my wife just a piece of my mind. And I read the scripture. He's painting a beautiful, newer picture in my marriage. Or another one. Maybe you can relate to this. Uh, anybody been angry at anybody this year? <laughs> anybody been angry at anybody this morning? <laughs> And just start thinking all the things you want to say to them. Get even. And then you read the scripture. And it talks about forgive others the way that God has forgiven us. And all of a sudden it's palimpsest. <laughs> Erasing over the old. And God is painting a beautiful new masterpiece. 
So if our enemy's number one tactic is falsehood, and we are to counter it with truth, and we go to the scripture, how do we use this thing effectively? And that's what I want to close with. I, I want to be sure that we know how to use this effectively. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 describes the, the word of God as a, as a sword. And like any good weapon, you can, um, you can um, obviously defend yourself with it. You can also hurt yourself with it. Um, uh, imagine using nunchucks for the first time. You know what I'm saying? You're swinging those things around, and you probably know how those story always ends. Uh, whoever's using it for the first time always ends up hurting themselves. And the truth is, like when it comes to the scripture, you could hurt yourself with this if you don't know how to wield it, if you don't know how to use it. And so I think we've got to get really, really good at this because we've all been around somebody who's weaponized the Bible and the, 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 twitch, the, the kind of twist scripture around to make it say whatever they want it to say and they can hurt people unnecessarily with it. This is a very powerful tool, a very powerful weapon, and we've got to learn how to use it. You know, as a, as a pastor, I, I'd be so delighted if, if every one of us would just make a commitment that we would read the Bible each day. But the, the, the reality is we, we need to do more than just read it. We need to understand it. You know, I think it's fair to say that, uh, that all the demons know what the Bible says. We, we've got to go beyond just a head knowledge of it. We've got to understand it. And so what I want to invite you into today is to begin studying the Bible, a deep dive in, in fact, I, before we get out of here, man, I want to give you what took me three years to learn in seminary. I want to give you a one-minute lesson on how to study the Bible. Now, this is the ESV study Bible. It's my number one recommendation for a Bible. It's a very powerful tool. It's great if you're just learning about the Bible. It's great if you're a fellow pastor and anyone in between. And, and this is how you use the study Bible. You could open it up to something like we study today, like 2 Corinthians. And here on the top, is the scripture. This part is the Bible. And then down below are theolo theologians' notes on this. So maybe you're reading something in the Bible and you're like, man, what does, that, what does that mean? Or what does that mean for us today? You can go down here and see notes on how to understand this. So if you've ever read the Bible and you or started reading the Bible and you got discouraged because you couldn't understand it, man, pick up one of these. And then, then over here on the side are what we call references. It shows you, like whatever you read here, it shows you where else in the Bible it talks about the same subject. Now this is critical because one of the most important things about um, studying the Bible is that we let the Bible interpret the Bible. You can't just read a Bible verse and say, well, that means whatever you want it to mean. No, we need to look at where else the Bible says the same, uh, the, talks about the same subject. And then you read all the different areas, and then you get a well-rounded view of what the Bible is actually saying right here. Uh, just a quick illustration on that would be um, today in, in culture, this idea of defining what is love. Well, y you could just say love is whatever you want it to be. But if we want to get to like, hey, wh what is, how does the Bible define love? then we'd want to go to all the different scriptures that talk about love to truly understand how God defines love. And these references here, they'll help you understand that. And then every good study Bible like this one is going to include a, a topical index in the back. Maybe you're struggling with something and you just want to, you want to fact check it. You want to know what the Bible says about this, about that person you're having a hard time getting along with or, or how uh, God's view of marriage or, or whatever. Let's just take, for example, you want to learn about faith. You go back here, you flip to the F's, you look at faith, and it'll show you a bunch of different scriptures that talk about that topic. Go read the scripture. My friends, we've got to get better at understanding the Bible. And if you don't have a study Bible, I want to encourage you to pick one up. Uh, the best place to get one is just going to be on Amazon. Uh, the ESV study Bible, you can probably get one used for just a few dollars. Or uh, you could get one brand new like this one for probably about $25 or $30. I would encourage you this week, pick up a study Bible. Don't just read the Bible. Man, let's learn to understand it. Now, as we're, as we're counterattacking falsehood with truth, let, let me also say this. We are always to counterattack with patience and grace and gentleness. In fact, we can look at this last scripture. It comes from 2 Timothy chapter 2, 
The context for this is that Paul, Paul was addressing falsehood that made its way into a church. And here's what he says. He says, a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone. Now, now Mass, and help me out here. We must be kind to who? Kind to the people who agree with us? Kind to the people who are right? No, kind to everyone. Be able to teach and be patient with difficult people. Anybody here sitting next to someone who's sitting next to someone who's difficult? <laughs> what are we to do with them? Slap them in the face? No. Be patient with difficult people. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change these people's hearts and they will learn the truth. Then they will come to their, their senses and escape from the devil's trap for they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. Maybe it's you, maybe it's a loved one. And maybe there is, man, just a weed of falsehood starting to grow, and we need to confront it. And we need to confront it with the word of God. But class, let's never forget, when we pull this, this weapon out, the sword, the word of God, man, we do so with patience, we do so with gentleness, and we do so with grace. I want to leave you with this last thought. What is stressing you out the most right now? And do not raise your hand if the person is sitting right next to you, okay? What is stressing you out the most right now? That story you're telling yourself about that person, is it even true? Let's dive into the word of God and find out. Let's pray. God, we love you. Thank you for your goodness. Amen.